Hello, once again, here's a mini lecture for the psychology of human sexuality. And today we're going to talk about uh, the nature of varieties of sexual expression that do not fit into uh, the group of sexual behaviors that most people engage in. And so what we're really talking about are, <clears throat> are things that are as opposed to ones in which couples engage in, although some, in some cases that's true, they're more often likely to be solitary, they are likely to be uh, mostly males, they are mostly uh, uh, ones that have a high potential for compulsivity, so they can become what some people call addictions, uh, that's a, a disputed term for this. Uh, but it, the other part of this is, is that the, the portion of human sexuality, sexual behavior, uh, that is uh, in some ways an objectification is magnified in these kinds of behaviors, okay? So please understand that even in uh, a loving romantic couple's relationship, there is some component of objectification so that... Uh, Males who look upon a female partner dressed in a certain way gets them going. Now, we could argue that that's a, a kind of objectification. You can't get away from this objectification. But these, these behaviors are, are so objectifying that in some cases, when they reach a level of severity that is very high in many ways, the partner is an ancillary factor. So the, the partner is not really necessary. <laughs> and I'll explain some examples of that as we move along here. Okay, so um, what we're really talking about is something called paraphilias. And these involve non-human objects, primarily, at least a s tense sexual interest in non-human objects. The f could involve the physical suffering or psychological humiliation or distress of a partner or the other person engaged in this behavior with them. It could involve children or other non-consenting adults. It could be diagnosed if the person uh, uh, only fantasizes about doing these things. Okay? And I want to add that, that, that variations in sexual behavior are not all paraphilias. So most of what people do that are experimentations in terms of what they like to do sexually, what they would like to try, uh, are not are don't fit into this category. So the word variety is 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 sometimes misused here. So another point I want to make is usually when you have someone who has a moderate to severe level of paraphilia, that there's often another one present. Okay, and I'll mention some examples of that as we move along here. So there are two basic categories. There's the non-coercive -co uh, alternate behaviors and paraphilias. Okay? And then there's the coercive variety. And the coercive ones are, of course, uh, essentially illegal. Now, we can't cover all of these. There just isn't time. Perhaps an, another day, a longer video, or two or three or four. So the non-consensual ones imply that there's a victim uh, of some unwanted behavior. And I've said before that, that it's very easy to tell what is and what is not agreed upon, wanted, desired. That's, this is not hard to determine. It's essentially an assault. It's essentially a, a, a gross boundary violation in one way or another. And so it is a privacy invasion, it is, it, it is usually illegal, and the term deviant is sometimes used to describe these things, sexual deviance, okay? But that's more uh, something that's designated by the law or uh, uh, by lay people. It's an old term. Okay. So one of these things is bondage and discipline, as opposed to sadomasochism. So bondage and discipline means uh, basically tying someone up, uh, uh, humiliating them in some way or another, verbally or 
in some other way. Um, um, now, most of these don't go to the next level, which is true sadomasochism. And most of the sadomasochist uh, folks don't rise to the level of masochistic disorder or sadistic disorder. Um, so sexual sadism and sexual masochism disorder are, are something beyond, well beyond bondage and discipline. Now, bondage and discipline is a, is, is a ritualistic kind of set of behaviors for most couples. And, and these are couples, regardless of their sexual orientation. And in general, one person occupies the top and one person occupies the bottom. Those can switch, but often they maintain those positions, one or the other. And uh, they do such things as enact role-playing or scripts. They often have a safe word they use that the person who is being dominated, uh, who is being tied up or restrained or humiliated in some way, um, could utter, and then everything would stop. Uh, those are some of the things that are done. And, and in fact, the, the S&M crowd, they often call themselves, you know, a, a special group. They do not consider themselves in any way um, inappropriate or uh, that they're harming anyone. In fact, you could argue they're not. They have clubs that they go to in larger cities or in smaller clubs uh, or uh, that, uh, that permit that or in towns. Oklahoma City has a group of, uh, of B&D folks who uh, go to different houses and put on shows and so on. Uh, so I've been told by someone who is a member of that group. And I heard there were two, but I know of only one at this point. So we can, we can have a, 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 a continuum of behaviors from normal and healthy things like playful assertiveness, you know, all the way to deriving sexual pleasure by hurting someone who is not interested in that. So we can go from not even B and D, but rather just sort of occupying a temporary assertive role with a partner, um, all the way to illegal activity. Okay. Um, now, it is fairly common to see couples doing some things, or at least trying some things, that would fall in the category of bondage and discipline. Twelve percent of women and twenty-five percent of men respond to erotic stories that involve masochistic themes. 5% and 12%, 5% of women and 12% of men engage in uh, fantasy with masochistic themes. About 50%, 50% of sexually active adults uh, enjoy being uh, uh, spanked, more women than men, um, or scratched a little or bitten or in some ways uh, verbally uh, receiving aggressive messages. Um, so this is not something that's rare, okay? Um, so I, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going down a list that I have here in case you wonder why I'm looking off. I have a list of things I want to cover and things that I don't want to cover um, that go into too much detail. So um, there is really no clinical way if you're a therapist, to measure or to differentiate really as a measurement between pathological from non-pathological masochistic fantasy or for that matter, some level of sadistic fantasy. There's no clear dividing line. There's no measurement tool that's available. There's there, there's a couple that have been tried, and they really aren't, in my view anyway, aren't very good. But there are physical risks associated with B&D, of course, uh, cutting buff blood supply and so on. There are risks then when we're talking about uh, sadomasochism, which and I want to differentiate this to. B&D is about um, restraining and, uh, and directing the behavior of another person, uh, humiliating them perhaps, but not a desire to cause them pain. And the person who is the, the, uh, the uh, receiver of that treatment is not interested in pain. In, in sadomasochism, what we're talking about is a person who dishes out more than just restraint, but including that, and more than just uh, 
humiliation, but that's often included. It's really also about causing severe restriction in movement and discomfort. And the person who's receiving that likes that. You'll hear people speak in that lifestyle about how it gives them a sense of freedom and release and those sorts of things. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I have not treated someone for this because I've never had someone come in and say, I want to be treated for this. That's not something they, they typically say. These sorts of things can be associated with drug and alcohol use. And I have treated one couple who were meth addicted and were involved in very severe uh, sadomasochistic activity in which he was, uh, he required uh, surgery following a bad infection that he received. So without any details, um, addictions and substance use generates bad judgment, doesn't it? It reduces your ability to withhold impulse and and um, and make better decisions. You know. So escalated behavior can be a problem. So when it, when it goes to the level of S and M, it can go to the next level, which could could give rise to a real paraphilia, which would be the uh, sexual sadism and masochistic disorders. In addition, these sorts of things are often associated with other kinds of paraphilias, including asphyxia, okay, which is restriction of airways to create lightheadedness, which may improve, according to those who do it, the sense of orgasm. Clismophilia, which is the uh, which is a ritualistic enema, giving and receiving, uh, that can get very wacky. Um, urophilia, which is, uh, or urolagnia, which is um, the interest in urinating on a partner or receiving urine, perhaps even ingesting it. And coprophilia, which has to do with feces. And that's a very dangerous paraphilia, because you're, you're, uh, you're going to be involved in uh, contact with infectious materials bacteria and so on. I may have to do two videos of this. It looks like I'm taking a little longer than I thought I would. Okay, so like many disorders, uh, the true paraphilia of sexual sadism disorder and masochistic disorder requires six months of at least fantasizing about these activities or behaving using those activities or some combination of that. Um, now, in the beginning, again, these often occur within the context of consenting adults, they, but it can get out of hand very quickly, as I said. Um, okay. A bit on treatment, which would go for many of the things we're going to talk about, um, if I can continue this. SSRIs can uh, curb some level of focus on these behaviors, particularly we would want to do use that when we have depression within the client. Antiandrogens will uh, withdraw from, from the body sec the secretion of testosterone, that is to say the body will not secrete that. And maybe antipsychotics, which are both sedating and if there is some level of psychosis or a border a sliding into an essential psychosis on occasion that may be useful. Usually, these folks within these uh, within the sadistic disorder are incarcerated when, once they're caught. And of course, you would know that um, serial killers often have uh, the sadistic um, portion of this dynamic. In terms of sexual masochism disorder. The same thing for six months, but it's about being humiliated and punished and harmed and real acts of receiving those sorts of things. Extreme pain sometimes. The people who are hung by hooks and stuff from the ceiling in what look like ritual, ritual or religious uh, ceremonies uh, um, are maybe ones which contain individuals who have sexual masochism disorder. And for both of these the sadistic disorder and the masochistic disorder, there's distress. Okay, so hold on there, and we're going to go to part two.